So we, we are about to begin the last plenary talk. And in the very beginning, I was asked to announce that in the soccer match, Germany won over France 1 to 0. And I hope it cheers up a part of the audience. <laughs> so the final, final plenary talk of the ICT 20. Oh, yes, my name is Alexander Barg, and I was asked to, to make this announcement, even though I'm not a program chair. So I decided to dress up for the occasion, and I'm wearing a T-shirt of the Information Theory Workshop 2015 in Jerusalem. Uh, the talk is, uh, will be given by Professor Vijay Kumar. Uh, Vijay uh, got his both undergraduate and master degrees from, in electrical engineering from Indian Institute of Technology and a PhD from the University of Southern California. Uh, after getting a PhD in, 2000, in, in 1983, Vijay spent the next 20 years as a professor faculty member at USC before moving to the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore in 2003, uh, where he has been, he currently is a chair of the uh, Electrical communica Communications Engineering and holds a chaired professor's position. And at the same time, he is also an adjunct professor at the University of Southern California. Uh, Vijay's research has been mostly in, in coding theory, sequence design, algebraic coding theory, uh, a pseudorandom, family of pseudorandom sequences that he co-designed in the 80s is now a part of 3G WCDMA standard. Uh, Vijay moved on to do algebraic coding and he co-authored the celebrated paper uh, that in, of 1994 uh, that made a connection between nonlinear binary codes and codes over ring alphabets such as Z4 that propelled research uh, of codes of a ring alphabet that has been going on to this day. He moved on to uh, design the first and, and the most well-known low-complexity algorithm of constructing algebraic geometry codes that meet the asymptote celebrated Sfassman bladud singh bound that improves for large alphabets the gilbert varshamov bound, asymptotic gilbert varshamov bound. He worked on uh, space-time codes, and his latest interest has been codes for distributed storage, which is the subject of today's talk. Vijay has been involved with the Information Theory Society, serving as a member of Board of Governors, associate editor, and he will be uh, one of the co-chairs of the Technical Program Committee of ISIT 2015. So if you want to know which papers will be favored for next year's submission, listen carefully to his talk. And with that, I'm giving it to Vijay. Okay, good morning and thank you all for coming. Couldn't have been uh, easy after last night's banquet. Uh, like to thank Sasha for the very, very kind introduction. Uh, couldn't think of a better person to have uh, introduced me. Uh, and uh, also thanks to the TPC co-chairs uh, Gerhard and Olgitsa and Seyang and Ubli for the invitation to give this plenary. Uh, it's a privilege and an honor. I've been coming to ISIT for the last 30 years. So I uh, can't think of a better place to give a plenary talk. So this talk is about uh, coding for Distributed storage. I guess uh, I'm going to put on. Okay. Column mic, and uh, hopefully that's better. Okay, very good. Um, so, so uh, the talk aims to actually provide an overview of some recent exciting developments in coding for distributed storage. Uh, but this area has been growing really, really fast, and there's a lot of work. So what I think it will end up being is one of many possible perspectives on this area. And uh, as I said, it's because of time constraints and the explosive, uh, explosive growth of research in this uh, field. So apologies in advance to all of those whose work is overlooked or not appropriately emphasized, and there will undoubtedly be many such uh, instances. And again, thank you for coming. Uh, so I'll begin with some acknowledgments. I should first of all thank 
Kanir Ramchandran for introducing me to this uh, very fascinating area. Uh, this was way back in December of 2008, you know, so uh, I think uh, if you give uh, someone a job, that's much better than giving him money. So thank you very much for that. Uh, and also thanks for Alex Damakis. He's been an amazingly energetic and creative, uh, dynamic creative force in this area. Uh, it's always fun to chat with him. Um, and in terms of research collaboration, there's Kanan Ramchandran again. And then for a brief period, there was a small uh, group in uh, UT Austin, uh, Natalia Silverstein, Ankit, Ojan, and Sriram Vishwanath. We did some joint work with them. Most recently, we've been collaborating with a team from AT&T, Shauti and Vanit Agarwal Vinay. And we've also been trying to take a crack at implementing some of this, uh, these codes. And uh, so we teamed up with a small group uh, at NetApp in uh, Bangalore, so uh, should acknowledge uh, their collaboration also, Srinivasan, Ranjit, and Siddhartha. And of course, this work uh, is really, I think, uh, built on the efforts of my students. I've been very fortunate, as many of you all know, to have some really good students, in particular, uh, Rashmi and Nihar. Uh, they spent three years for me, two years in a master's, and one year doing project uh, assistantship. They're now at UC Berkeley, uh, and I'll say more about their work later. Govinda Kamath, now at Stanford. Uh, Prakash and Lalita were about to graduate with a PhD from ISC Bangalore. And so that means that uh, they represent two excellent opportunities to pick up a postdoc, I must say. Uh, Berenjit and Nikhil, continuing uh, PhD students here. Kaushik Sintor, a master's student. Other interaction, just started some uh, interaction with uh, Sasha Bhag, looking forward to it very much and also sporadic discussions with Salim over the years. So the distributed uh, storage networks setting is uh, basically one in which uh, data is dispersed across nodes in the network, uh, primarily to enable easy access to data, but also to enable uh, robustness to node failure. The amount of data stored is huge, and it can run to several tens of petabytes. There are many desirable attributes. I mean, the uh, storage designers have an endless list. But the ones that we'll focus on here, which are important to them, are uh, low repair bandwidth, which is a reference to the amount of data download needed to repair a failed node, and low repair degree, which is the number of helper nodes accessed uh, for node repair. And you see uh, uh, Google Data Center ins insides of. So now the title had asking more of an old friend, so I guess it's time to reveal the friend's identity in case you haven't already guessed. So this is none other than the ubiquitous block code. Okay, so the friend that we are asking more of is the block code. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, over the years, the block code has served the information theory community very well. Right? It's uh, enabled you to overcome noise and uh, fading and all that. And this time, however, we want something more than minimum distance for dimension. Okay, we want a code that has the attributes the data storage needs, that is we want low repair bandwidth and low repair degree, and on top of minimum distance. Okay, all right, so in this sense we are asking for more, and I think this, uh, the phrase more is justified because in fact, along the way, they will turn up codes which do all that MDS codes do and more. They don't give up on minimum distance in order to give you something extra. So that, I, I mean, I did not foresee that, and I think it's uh, the brilliance of uh, the Berkeley team to think that such a thing was possible. And uh, okay, so it's really asking more. So there are two problems. Uh, you want codes with low repair bandwidth, and you want low repair degree, and there are two solutions. Okay, so I'll uh, talk about these in turn, and you can see the teams. The top is the Berkeley team, and the bottom is uh, the uh, team from Microsoft. So regenerating codes. So this paper has been uh, well recognized, uh, justly so. So uh, just to go over what um, is exactly a regenerating code. So there are a bunch of parameters, and I'll go through them uh, slowly. So n is just the number of total number of nodes in the system, and each node stores alpha symbols. So right away there's a difference because when you think of a, a traditional block code, each code symbol is a scalar, but now they are vectors. So every code symbol Every code symbol is really alpha smaller symbols drawn from a finite field FQ. So that's one difference right away. Now, you want that to be, to be able to uh, connect to any K nodes 
and uh, recover the data. So that's not new because uh, nodes are like code symbols and read Solomon codes do that for you. So that part is not new. But what is new is that supposing a node fails. Now with traditional uh, read Solomon codes, there really is no natural option to repair a failed node other than downloading all the data from the remaining nodes and then extracting from it whatever information you need to replace the failed node and then replacing the node. Okay, so there is no efficient way because what is stored in a node is very small but there doesn't seem to be any option other than to download all of it for the most part. So, so the, the thing that uh, Alex Demakis and uh, Kanan and I understand that this came out of a class project at uh, Berkeley started by Kanan. So the question they asked is well can you design codes where repair is easy? Okay, so they, I mean you have to put some structure to it. So the structure that they put in is that you should be able to repair a failed node by connecting to any D nodes and downloading beta symbols from each of them. Now this D has to be larger than, larger than or equal to K, you can figure that out. But the key point is that this beta is much, much smaller than alpha and that's where your saving comes in. So your D beta, which is the total amount of download, is much smaller than the file size. Okay, and that's the uh, main point of uh, regenerating code. So again, those are the parameters. Capital B is the file size. It's the total amount of data that you're actually storing across the network. And you distinguish between two types of repair. There's functional repair and then there is exact repair. So in functional repair, the idea is that uh, when a node fails, you repair it, taking care to ensure only that the system that's left, the network that's left, still behaves like a regenerating code and satisfies the rules. Exact repair says, well, I, what I want is actually the replacement node to store exactly what the failed node stores. And of course, there are system advantages to having a stationary uh, network, right, which is where you know what each node stores instead of having to keep track in a dynamic fashion what happens. So exact repair is, prepared, uh, is preferred, and these are different. Now, there's a, uh, if you take this network, and again, this is in the Damacus paper, if you take this network and uh, now look at how it evolves with time, that is the node fails, it's replaced, another node fails, it's replaced, and so on. Now a data collector should be able to recover the data by connecting to any K nodes, regardless of which stage of uh, time uh, you tap from, right? So or how many repairs the particular node has undergone. So this makes it a multicast uh, network, and you can use uh, the cut set bound of network coding, and you can find the min cut, and uh, that gives you a bound on the file size, and that's represented by this equation over here. So a code is optimal if the file size is equal to the quantity on the right side. So uh, the optimum file size is decided by the parameters k, d, alpha, and beta. Now let's suppose, on the other hand, that you actually have an alpha, uh, optimal code. So that means that you have equality in this expression. It turns out that for given k, d, and file size b, there are multiple choices for alpha and beta for which you can satisfy this equation. So in other words, there are different flavors of optimality. Okay, so this gives rise to what is called the storage repair bandwidth trade-off, where every point on this curve here represents an optimal code. But they have different flavors, so for example, here along the x-axis you're plotting alpha which is representative of the amount of data that's stored in the storage network and along the axis your y-axis you're plotting d beta which is the amount of data download needed to repair a failed node. So uh, there are two extremal points. So this point over here is called the minimum storage regenerating point because here you put a premium amount on storage so you store the least possible. This point over here, the premium is on bandwidth download, so you actually download the least possible amount of bandwidth. So the initial attention was on designing codes for these two extreme points. And the other points are called interior points. So now I'll uh, talk about a couple of constructions for codes operating at these extreme points, and it's going to be a biased uh, presentation because we're going to talk about the constructions that came out of our group. There are others as well. Okay. I'll, I'll, at least I'll mention them. So the first one, and I, I think uh, there's also a reason for describing these particular constructions because I think they are beautiful and, uh, uh, and they have some advantages and also uh, general. So the first one is so-called repair by transfer MBR code. 
And uh, this, again, so this is the start of uh, a set series of results by Nihar and Rashmi. Uh, so, so supposing in, in this particular case, your file size uh, is composed of nine symbols. Okay? And so encoding is, uh, I'll describe through a series of steps. So in the first step, what you do is you take the parity of these nine symbols, and that is P. So that's your 10th symbol. Then the next thing is, this, now, uh, I, I guess I should have explained it, but we are trying to design a distributed storage code for five nodes in such a way that by connecting to any three nodes, you recover the data, and you should be able to repair uh, a failed node. Okay? So you have your 10 symbols, coded symbols, and then you start with a pentagon, which represents the five nodes, and make it completely connected. Now, the pentagon has five choose two edges for a total of 10 edges. So what you do is you place, place each of these symbols in turn on one of these edges, okay? So at the end of 10 steps, you've loaded all the symbols onto the edges of the pentagon. So what you have to determine to complete the design is figure out what is actually stored in each of these nodes. So that's easy. You just store in each node whatever lies on the incoming edges. So for example, here you see that uh, since this particular node the incoming edges have P, 5, 2, and 6. That's what you actually store. And you do the same thing for the other nodes. So with that, the design is complete. Okay, it's a very simple design. And now you can throw away what's on the edges, and this is your design. So now the question is, does it do what you want it to do? That is, you should be able to repair a failed node, and you should be able to recover all the data by connecting to any three nodes. Does it do that? So we'll do node repair, but that's easier. So let's say that the first uh, node on top has actually failed. And I'm sure if you just think about it for two minutes, you'll figure out how to repair it. Because every node shared exactly one symbol in common with its neighbors. So these neighbors will become helper nodes and then supply the missing symbol. Okay, so that's what they do. So each of these four neighbors here, one, two, three, four, has one symbol to actually supply. And they supply that. And you've replaced the node. So node repair, that's why these are called uh, repair by transfer in the R codes. Node repair is exceedingly simple. OK, now the second thing is, what about data collection? So data collection, what you actually want is that you want to be able to recover the data by connecting to any three nodes. So you should be able to connect to these three nodes and recover uh, all the data. Now, if you think about it, since any two nodes, I mean, the data really comes from the edges, the only data symbol that you don't have access to by connecting to these three is precisely this one symbol that's on the edge that connects to the two nodes uh, that you don't have access to. So you have access to nine symbols. You only don't have access to the 10 symbol. But then you encode it using a single parity MDS code, so that's not a problem. So nine symbols is enough to actually recover all the data, and you're done. Okay, So that's how data collection is. So the parity helps you regain nine, and so you're fine. So data collection is also very simply accomplished. Second, again, uh, uh, brilliant construction, uh, Nihar and Rashmi, the product matrix code. And I'll try to give a slightly different description, with, which hopefully gives a little bit of insight into why the construction is, uh, uh, takes on the form that it does. Now, uh, this construction is good for both, for constructing an MBR code for all parameters. And an MSR code, provided the rate is less than half. It gets more technical than that, but basically, this is good for constructing codes of rate less than half, but not really larger. So how does this uh, work? So uh, so it, there's one perspective from which it's very easy to describe. So there is, you have your input data stream that you want to store, the file size, of, uh, file of size capital B. You pass it through a precoder. But this precoder is different from uh, other precoders in the sense that the output of the precoder is a matrix. It's a matrix, redundant matrix arrangement of data symbols. And what is, how is, what form does the redundancy take on? It takes on the form of what uh, you might call sub-block symmetry. That is, the matrix is composed of sub-blocks which are themselves symmetric. So symmetry is important here. I mean, it's, uh, I mean, you, I can't say that it's necessary, but it works. Okay, and I'll explain why it works. After you have this matrix, then you pass this through a generator matrix, and there are several possibilities here. But let's say a Vandermonde matrix will work. So let's assume it's Vandermonde. So now, if this u here was a row vector, 
then it's just the standard encoding of a read solvent code. There's nothing different. But this is now a matrix, and it's a mat and a matrix with some symmetry. Okay, so you're, it's like encoding a bunch of row vectors using a common generator matrix, but the data are intertwined. Okay. And so at the output, what you get is G ti U times G. So U is the matrix that contains the data, and G is the generator matrix. So we call C, instead of calling it the code word, we call it the code matrix. Okay, and just to keep things simple, we called it the product matrix code simply because it's the product of two matrices, but you could think of other names. <coughs> Okay, so that is the form of the code. And next I'll show you what are the types of symmetry that come up, and then I'll explain why you need symmetry. Okay, so this uh, construction is good for both MSR and MBR. So here, MBR for the case when D is equal to K, and the symmetry requirement there is very simple. U is equal to U transpose. You need that, that data matrix be symmetric. Now MBR for D greater than K, then it is very similar to this, except that you actually introduce some zeros in the right-hand corner, okay? So this overall matrix is symmetric, or you can think of this individual matrix here as being symmetric. So this is what I meant by sub-block symmetry, so this thing here is uh, symmetric. Um, yeah, and then for the MSR case, uh, it turns out that if you construct it for D equal to 2K minus 1, you can extend the construction to other values. So for this canonical case, it, uh, the data matrix takes on the form S1, S2, where each SI is symmetric. This so is sub-block symmetry again. So why is it that this symmetry is important here? And uh, so one way to look at it is that, look, your code is C is U times G. So you use your data matrix, and G is the generator matrix, and so the columns of the generator matrix right, are G1, G2, up to Gn which means that if you think about the contents of the jth node, that is u times g sub j. So if the fth, so by the way, the symmetry comes in because of node repair, because that is what is really different. Data collection is not different. It's what we've been doing for years. It's node repair that's different, and that's where the symmetry requirement comes in, okay? So now let's assume that the fth node has failed, which means that what you want to recover is u times g sub f. So you call upon helper. You're allowed to call upon D helper nodes. So let's say that's I1, I2, up through I sub D. These are your D helper nodes. And they need to help you to recover U times G sub F. Okay? So you have access to these, and you want to construct U times G sub F. So what, okay, so now this is how repair is conducted. Okay? And after I show you how it's done, and I'll do this mechanically, then we'll come back and say, okay, what is it that made it work? So this, this matrix being random on, it turns out that uh, this is invertible. So when, when you, any D columns, that submatrix is invertible. So you actually can invert this. So you have U G sub D times G sub D inverse. Okay, so that means that you can get rid of this. And now you multiply by G F transpose on the left. That is the transpose of the Fth column. You multiply on the left as a row vector. So what that gives you is G F transpose U. But what you want, really want, is U times GF. You want U times GF. What you have is UF transpose, uh, GF transpose U. If you take the transpose, you get U transpose GF. But if U is symmetric, you're done. Okay, so in some sense, there is this operating from the left, operating from the right that goes on, and symmetric matrices are able to treat these equivalently, and that's why symmetry is important. So repair brings about this new twist, and the symmetry takes care of it. I, I don't think this is the only way to construct codes for this. I, I'm sure it's not, but this is how this this is how this particular construction works. Uh, there are there's another uh, very nice uh, construction, but I will not uh, go through it. Uh, this is these are constructions which are very important uh, in practice because they deal with high rate. And uh, there are two sets of authors, one from USC um, and then another one from Caltech. And uh, this uh, codes, uh, they result in uh, high rate codes, MSR codes, which is the difficult thing to do. And uh, uh, so in this particular paper, they construct it for a limited number of parity nodes, that's my understanding. Uh, here in this paper, they construct codes in which you can repair so these are systematic codes where the data is explicitly uh, visible within the code, and they 
repair the systematic nodes, and this is extended in a subsequent paper to repairing even the parity nodes. So they are called zigzag codes because they're built out of permutation matrices, and I'll just very quickly show you what it looks like and not dwell on it much more, but uh, uh, really nice and uh, uh, brilliant construction. So here you can actually see that uh, this is a case when you have three systematic nodes, two parity nodes, and uh, these card suits here, club hearts, diamonds, etc., tell you which uh, parity checks cover which portions of the data, and they are governed by permutations. And uh, in my mind, they correspond to permutations which correspond to a dyadic shift that is shifting when you represent uh, indices and vectors. Okay, but uh, that's the idea behind the zigzag code. The code that repairs the parity nodes is more complicated. And I will, uh, because there's a lot more to cover, I will not, and also because of a personal bias, I will not uh, cover this code anymore. But a uh, beautiful construction. <laughs> so now, We've talked about the interior points. So what about uh, the extremal points? What about the interior points? So right in the beginning, another of the set of results they had was Rashmi sh showed that if you look at this trade-off, then in the red portion, uh, it is not possible to construct exact repair codes. On the other hand, there were uh, results from uh, Syed Jafar, Kadambe, and others, and Kanan Ramchandran, who showed that it is possible uh, to approach the MSR point for all values of parameters asymptotically with exact repair. So that gives rise to the question, I mean, okay, so it's not possible to construct exact repair codes which lie exactly on these interior points, but can you approach this? And uh, this problem remained open for quite some time, so Alex uh, felt emboldened to wager 12 bottles of Ujo, I think, uh, to anyone who solved this problem who determine, I mean, is the exact repair trade-off really different from the uh, functional repair trade-off. And this was solved in a very interesting way by Xiao Tian uh, from AT&T. So what he did was he focused on a particular case of four nodes, 433 case. So the N is 4, K is 3, D is 3. And he used a computer-aided proof that builds upon Raymond's information theory inequality prover framework. So he phrased all the requirements of a regenerating code in information theoretic terms, reduced them to inequalities, and then derived another inequality. And so what that gave him was uh, showed that the trade-off in the exact repair case cannot go below this. This is the functional repair trade-off, and that's the bound that he got. And he was able to construct a code for this particular point. We have constructions here and here, and through something called space sharing, you can generate this. So the exact repair trade-off in this way was characterized for the 433 case. Okay, so, okay, so Alex gave him the equivalent of 12 bottles of Ujo. Uh, so we looked at this problem, and uh, so uh, we were motivated by this result to look again at this problem. And the first step we started is we went back to the paper jointly with uh, Nihar and Rashmi and looked at what they had done to prove non-existence here. Okay, oh, sorry what exactly they had done to prove non-existence here. So we went back and looked at that, and we found that actually it's not very hard to extend that because it turns out that they prove non-existence by arriving at a contradiction. And uh, the contradiction uh, was obtained by comparing two quantities which were very far apart and which were supposed to be equal. So we felt, well, if they're so far apart, you should be able to improve the bound. And uh, sure enough, we were. So it turns out that we deal with something called the repair matrix, but we were able to improve it, and we do it for all n, k, and d. Uh, we now show that the exact repair trade-off is different from the functional repair trade-off, except in that one region close to the MSR point. So for example, here is the case of the 544, when this is the functional repair. The red is the new outer bound that we derive, and it turns out there are some constructions for the interior points. And these interior point constructions give you this blue uh, curve. And uh, there's one point at which they meet. So that turns out to be an optimal code, the first known which does not lie on the functional repair trade-off. So there are, uh, since, so we uh, came up with a construction for an interior point simply by layering MDS codes in, an, uh, in a not so dumb way. And it turned out that the AT&T group also did something very similar. So we decided to combine forces. We now have a joint paper in submission. 
And subsequently, this construction, which we think of as the layered construction, was improved by Earnwall, and subsequently further improved by Gopraju, uh, Salim, and uh, Rob Calderbank. And uh, so now you have actually codes which perform like this. So now you're starting to see performance uh, uh, described for the interior points. This is the trade-off. Okay. So with that, I'll actually, uh, that concludes the detailed description of topics. There are many other aspects that have been explored. I'll just mention them in passing. And again, this is where the apologies are due. There's lots of beautiful work that went on here. Lovely work by cooperative uh, repair on cooperative repair by Ken Shum and uh, the group and also a group from uh, France. Uh, very nice connections with interference alignment. Um, uh, you know, I think Syed Jaffer uh, got into it partly because of that uh, connection. Work on security, how do you make these secure against uh, eavesdropping. Fractional repair codes, uh, Karnan had this uh, idea of, well, let's try to make repair as easy as possible, so he generalized it to functional repair. Sub-packetization bonds. This is a very interesting question. It turns out that the parameter alpha, in all the known constructions for high-rate codes, alpha is large. It's not known precisely how large alpha has to be or how it has to grow with the rate, but it seems to grow with the rate. So there are some bounds now, but that is an open problem to characterize how does alpha depend on the rate uh, of the code, or perhaps in more detail on n and k. Uh, this is just a slide on cooperative repair. I'll skip that. Uh, some references here, so I'll put up the slides later on for anybody who would like to uh, look at uh, the references in the area. So that concludes the first uh, class of codes, regenerating codes. The second class is a different direction for codes with storage called codes with locality. And a uh, quick word about nomenclature. I mean, there, these codes go by very many names. They're called locally repairable codes, codes with locality, locally recoverable codes, locally reconstructable codes, local reconstruction codes. The good thing is all these things on the right have a common acronym, LRC. Okay, so there are all these uh, LRCs. Okay. So that, this is just a quick uh, list of all the references in this area. Uh, as you can see, even in this area, uh, lots of uh, work has been done. And uh, um, so the pioneering work um, is this particular paper by Parikshit Gopalan, who's uh, coincidentally here, and uh, with uh, Ching Huang, uh, Smitsi, and Yekhanen. And this was uh, recognized at the awards luncheon on uh, Tuesday. Uh, so the idea in codes with locality is this, that if a node is fails in a distributed storage network, now we've been talking about amount of data download to repair the failed node. But what they pointed out was, you know, what is also important is how many nodes you talk to, okay? Because that talking means you're going to deal with traffic and you're going to inter, uh, read in, uh, in and out of disks, etc. So they said that we'd like to keep the number of nodes that you talk to small. So then they said, okay, one way you can do that is if you build a global code, in which, which is built out of smaller local codes. So if you take this particular example here, uh, in here the blue squares represent the message symbols, and the pink represent the parity symbols. So this dotted circle here means that this is a local code. It's a code that is protected by two parity symbols. This is also a local code protected by two parity symbols. These are two additional parities, which are global parities. And, okay, with respect to this, a code has R delta locality, a code symbol has R delta locality if it's protected by a local code whose minimum distance is greater than or equal to delta and whose block length is less than or equal to R plus delta minus 1. So here the local code that protects X1, for example, is of length 7 <coughs> and uh, the minimum distance, if you choose these parity symbols correctly, is at least 3. Okay, so that's the idea. And one distinguishes between the cases when you have locality for only the message symbols or for all the symbols. So for example, on top here, this particular code has locality only for the message symbols because only the message symbols are protected by a local code. And the advantage here is that if this particular symbol fails, then you only call upon the local code. So I guess from coding theory point of view, you're just, if you puncture the code, then 
as that's the code that you have. Okay. So if this fails, then you can actually call upon this to repair this. Uh, all symbol locality, uh, you want protection not only for the message symbols, but also for the parity symbols. So it's shown over here. And uh, so there is a slight uh, distinguish, uh, di distinction between these two classes of codes. So uh, in this uh, paper, which I consider beautiful uh, by Parikshit and all, they actually established this bound and showed that if you insist on locality, then there's a penalty to be paid for minimum distance. So the minimum distance is n minus. So here, kappa is the dimension of the code. I'm using kappa because we use k in regenerating codes. So uh, this is the singleton bound. This is the penalty that you pay for demanding locality. Okay? And uh, so Parikshit and his group established the bound for the delta equal to 2 case, and uh, we were able to, ex it's, it was very straightforward uh, extending their results. So this was the, uh, the very nice uh, bound that they had uh, derived. And there are several uh, constructions for uh, uh, codes with locality. And I know that I'm missing a few here. I've just listed some of the major ones. Um, but at any rate, there are many constructions that are available. Uh, previously, there were uh, constructions available for information locality, but due to a recent result, very nice result of uh, Sasha Barg and uh, Tamo, we now have constructions for all symbol locality also. Uh, okay, so now it turns out, of course, I guess uh, the Parikshit and his team had the advantage that they were working within Microsoft, and uh, so Microsoft could take advantage of the advances uh, in theory right away. So they actually put this code to work right away. So now this particular code is an example of a code with information locality. So the block length is 16. It's composed of two local codes, each of length 7, and there are two global parities. And uh, the advantage this particular code brings to the table is that, OK, so this uh, code, uh, see, uh, because data is exploding, what you'd really like to do is cut down on the overhead. That is, you have, want to operate with high rate codes. With Reed Solomon codes, if you operate at a high rate codes, like for example, a comparable code, you might consider 1612 Reed Solomon code then what you'd have to do is to repair a failed node, you'd have to talk to 12 other nodes. Whereas this code does, in effect, the same thing. But to repair a failed node, you only not need to talk to six. OK? So it reduces. Uh, so that option of reducing, uh, going to higher rates to read Solomon is not available simply because it's expensive to repair. So therefore, you have to look for other operations, uh, options. And this fits the bill nicely in the sense that it gives you the resilience that you want, and it allows you to repair, and it has a good rate because the redundancy is uh, 4 over, uh, I mean, uh, 12. So it's 1.33. So that is uh, much better than uh, uh, the earlier code, Reed Solomon code, which was a 9.6 code with a redundancy 1.5. And the claim is that, you know, since there's so much of data being s stored, this translate and this is on the website. This ended up saving them millions of dollars for the company. Okay. I think it's an amazing example of something going from theory to practice very fast. And I asked people at Microsoft uh, in Bangalore, and they said, yes, even for us, that's fast. Okay. So that's, that's very nice to see. <clears throat> now I just wanted to talk about the Tamobag construction, a very nice uh, construction, and has a very simple interpretation. Now, if you uh, read Solomon code, has a polynomial description. That is, it has a description in which the symbols of each code word can be represented as values of a polynomial. So for example, this is a polynomial of degree k minus 1, let's say, corresponding to dimension k. And uh, the values of it over different points in the finite field will correspond to a code word. You change the polynomial, you're changing the code word. So what uh, uh, Tamo and Barg uh, I guess must have asked themselves as well, if you want locality, that is, you want some relationship to exist between this, then that's in some sense equivalent to saying, for example, that you have these three points. If you can select a subset of the polynomials, don't use all the polynomials of the Reed-Solomon code, 
use a subset, the subset that have the property that their evaluations on these three points correspond to a line. So normally you'd have a quadratic through any three uh, values. But here, by restricting the class of polynomials, they actually had a linear polynomial. And linear polynomial translates into a local parity check on these three symbols. So in this way, they were able to construct codes for a very large uh, class of parameters. And this is very recent work, uh, very nice work. And uh, just another viewpoint in terms of parity check matrices, what this says is that the parity check matrix corresponding to this construction is the parity check matrix of the original reed solomon code, but with additional parities which correspond to the locality constraints. Okay, now continuing along. Um, so this is, gets back to another thought that we actually had. So if you recall, we had two problems. One is repair with uh, low bandwidth and repair with low degree. So the question is, well, why can't you do both at the same time? I mean, you may not be able to do exactly minimum bandwidth, minimum access, but maybe you can do some kind of a mixture. Okay. So it turns out that you can do that. And uh, we thought about this, and we felt pretty good about having come up on this. And the, it took us about a year to actually figure it out, because you had to work with the vector codes, and there were some tricky steps along the way. But then there was a conference in Ascona in Switzerland in 2012, and we found out that the group in Texas, UT Austin, had also come up on the same idea. Okay. So this is what we call codes with local regeneration. And so the idea here is just to combine the notions of regenerating codes and codes with locality. Okay. So the aim is to keep a low value of repair bandwidth and repair degree. And uh, specifically, each local code instead of being either a single parity check code or you know, uh, uh, some other kind of a code, MDS code, is actually a regenerating code. So the local codes are themselves regenerating codes. So uh, I won't go into much detail, but just give you an example of one such code. So here is an example code, uh, a local regenerating code, in which the local codes are regenerating codes. So specifically, it's we introduced the pentagon code, so you can see that the, there are two local codes. Each of them is a pentagon code, and you have a global parity code. Uh, it's also interesting how these were actually built, because it turns out that this local code with local regeneration is built out of a scalar code with uh, scalar code with locality. But I'm only going to mention that in passing. Okay, but but there are many constructions. This is just one of them, and in fact. When we uh, interacted with the team at NetApp, we settled upon this as the code, or a slight variation of this, uh, as the code that we wanted to try to implement. Because one of the nice things that this code has is that all uh, the code can be systematic, and all the message symbols are repeated twice. Now, one of the things that uh, codes for distributed storage are, I mean, uh, that's important in data storage is that you want to do some function computation on the storage, so something called MapReduce. So it helps to have multiple copies available, because you can then do divide and conquer. And these codes are very interesting because they, I mean, traditionally something called Hadoop, a file a distributed file system called Hadoop, actually replicates symbols three times, and that is enough availability for them to compute, do computations easily. This code replicates everything twice. So we said it's kind of in between. And maybe there's a niche uh, market for it. So this is the thing we were exploring. But the wall we ran into is that you know, you're trying to fit a code that you built on a framework that was built not considering making these codes into consideration. So I think the next step really should be is how do you, I mean, is it possible to design your storage system keeping in mind that there are these different coding techniques that you might possibly apply? So this is the. Uh, other paper from the UT Austin team. And we actually combined to write a joint paper in a different area. A uh, little bit about uh, application uh, focus. There have been uh, other teams attempting to uh, do, to put uh, theory to work, uh, notably uh, Alex uh, and his team. Uh, I think he's uh, beginning to influence the storage uh, community, and also uh, Nihar and Rashmi 
also have had some success through internships and following up. Just flash this at you. I think uh, what uh, Alex did was something called Zorbas. Zorbas, I think X, uh, that's the XOR here, and uh, using a local code and uh, showing its advantages in a distributed file system. And uh, uh, a system called Hitchhiker by Rashmi and Nihar, where they aim, uh, they use what they call piggyback uh, MDS codes, the idea being that you stack MDS codes and then you alter them so as to may facilitate repair. So they, and the advantage there is that you don't have to change the existing system very much and they got a paper accepted in SICOM. I think this paper was presented at uh, another uh, important conference called VLDB 2013. Okay, so uh, perhaps going a little bit fast, uh, but that was forced because there was a lot to cover. So now I'll talk about uh, Recent work. Recent work is saying that, okay, it's all, again on locality. The question is, you've been considering single erasures. Well, what happens if you want to consider multiple erasures? And uh, these are just some of the references, the different teams that have uh, worked on this problem. And there seem to be three options for dealing with multiple erasures. One is what, this is all our terminology, and uh, I don't claim that it's accepted everywhere. But one is what we might call the strong local codes approach. So this is the approach that we just saw when we said we took what Parikshit and his team had done and extended it to local codes which are more powerful. But then there was a team, I think, in China that said that, you know, that approach is good, but if you want to repair multiple erasures with locality, that doesn't give you the best minimum distance. We can actually improve upon it. So they came up on an idea of designing codes in which every code symbol is protected by multiple symbols. And then uh, multiple local codes, which allows uh, more than one erasure to be corrected. We'll see an example of that. And then we thought about it and said, actually, you know, even you can do slightly better than that by using something called we call sequential recovery. And I think this is interesting because, in some sense, this links. I mean, although this is a very very distant link, it links kind of to LDPC codes and fountain codes and all that because they also, for recovering from erasures, they rely on sequential recovery. Okay, so here's, I'll just present examples of these codes. So this is an example of a code where you can recover from multiple erasures with under the orthogonal parity check approach. So here, this is a very simple product code. So you have, you have your data and you have your parity. And you can see that if you look at, let's say, message symbol 5, then it's protected by two parity checks, the row parity and the column parity. So now, if there are two erasures, you see that you can actually recover, right? Because, I mean, if you... If these two symbols got erased, well, that's fine uh, because you can't use the column parity, but you can use the individual row parity parities. So because you have this uh, orthogonality, uh, you are you're sure that there is some parity that will bail you out, and this code is optimal. Then uh, the sequential recovery approach that we adopted said that, uh, you know, we are in the here. You see that every symbol is protected by two parities. Uh, two local codes. We said, well, that may not uh, actually be necessary. So in this example here, the green squares represent the data and the nodes represent the parity checks. You can see, for example, that a symbol like this is protected by just one parity, whereas something like this is protected by this parity and this parity. So there are two classes of symbols. So here the focus is on two erasures, and there are two classes of symbols, those that are protected by one local code and those which are protected by two local codes. And what happens if there are two erasures? So supposing this is erased, okay, and this is erased. Now this is participating in only one local code, and that local code has happened to have another symbol erased. So this parity is useless, and this cannot, you cannot recover this right away. But what you can do is you can recover five, because five participates in a different uh, parity. So you can first recover five, and then recover one. So this is sequential recovery. And so you're relaxing your requirements a little bit. You know, instead of insisting that you are protected by two local codes, uh, some symbols can be protected by one local code, and that gives you a slight uh, advantage. Okay? There are other aspects that uh, this, uh, this field, uh, for example, codes with locality can actually be used to give bounds on concatenated codes, because you can use concatenated codes as examples of uh, codes with locality. Uh, there's also a very nice uh, approach uh, 
uh, which is slightly theoretical, which says that you know if you have any kind of a constraint, if you want to build any kind of a constraint code, what you do is you spell out the constraint in terms of words, then you design, and I'm talking about linear codes now, and now you select the best possible parity check matrix that imposes those constraints. Uh, what does best mean? It means that, the, so the parity check matrix deals with the dual code. So there's something called the generalized Hamming weight hierarchy of a code. So it turns out that if the dual code has good weight hierarchy, then out of that you can construct good codes for whatever dimension you want satisfying the constraints. And in fact, the, the code that we just showed here is an example of a code that, that's optimal in that respect. Uh, the only bad thing about it is that you cannot control the field size. The field size could be large. You can do, you can really build optimal uh, constraint codes, uh, linearly constrained codes using this approach. Uh, but, and there's a very clear path towards how you do that, but then you have no control over the field size because the last step has to do with saying, yes, you can actually find for a large enough finite field. So that, there's a gap there to be closed. The connections with LDPC codes, because if you, if you talk about locality and someone looks at a bipartite graph of an LDPC code, says, well, we have lots of locality in this code, so what is new? So LDPC codes have lots of locality, but I mean, there's too much of locality to actually be able to understand the code, except with some exceptions in detail. So the question is, can you slowly, very, very slowly build your way to understanding a little bit more about LDPC codes by starting with this very humble approach when you have locality one, locality two, et cetera. So that's something that uh, we're thinking about. Uh, then uh, Parikshit and his team have uh, also been focusing on something very useful in practice, that is that your codes with locality have a bound on minimum distance, and that minimum distance only governs the worst case, but sometimes you can do better. So how do you design codes which for a given minimum distance handle uh, a lot of other cases in the best possible way. So that's also another direction that's being discussed. So with that, I'll actually say thank you, ISIT Hawaii. And uh, after tonight, after tonight, it's on to ISIT Hong Kong. Thank you. Thanks very much, Vijay, for this very interesting and broad talk. And uh, we have time for questions. In fact, we have quite some time, so questions are welcome from the audience, please. Well, let me start this discussion by asking the following question. So uh, there is much emphasis on minimum distance in particular. Uh, the bound involves the minimum distance, and at the same time, it seems that the most important case is to correct one erasure. So why do we care about the distance? Why, why isn't it enough to have you know, low distance and correct the mo most frequent case of a small number of erasures? Uh, that's a good question, but I, I just think it's just resiliency because, I mean, your data, I mean, you don't want to have data loss. So even for that very infrequent event, you want to rely, you want to have the, the, I mean, the secure, you want to be secure in the knowledge that even in the worst case, there are these global parities with increased complexity that you can rely upon to recover. So it's for that, those... Uh, yes, but at the same time, are there algorithms other than generic algorithms that would correct up to this large minimum distance? Because local algorithms are very simple, but what about the, the general algorithms correcting more than a small number of erasures? Yeah, so you're asking about complexity. Yes. So you would take, an, in this uh, hopefully infrequent case, you will take a hit on complexity. Everything, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. That's true. Other questions? Uh, thank you for the nice presentation. Is there any work in which, in addition to erasure, people consider the errors? Or is there any application for that? Yes, uh, there is. There's been some work, and in fact, there was one paper with Nihar and Rashmi some years back in which we considered both errors and erasures. And I think there is ongoing work. It's just not at the top of my uh, head to actually tell you. Uh, which, but there is work, and it's of interest, certainly. 
More questions, remarks? Well, it seems that there are no more, no, no more immediate questions, so let's thank Vijay for this very interesting talk.